We're still in October, so I'm sticking to this faintly horror theme. We've had horror concept art, we've had horror corporatism, and now we've got monsters. Not the most horrifying thing, but whatever. Monsters Inc, Monsters University, and more recently, Monsters at Work. This is a franchise that is near and dear to my heart. I mean, it's a Pixar franchise, of course it is. And since I really enjoyed making that Wreck-It Ralph episode of one villainous scene a month ago, damn it, I just feel like making another scene breakdown video essay. And our target lies with the middle child of the Monsters series. The black sheep of the family? Which one's the odd one out, actually? It's like a trifecta of spin-offs this franchise is. Anyway, Monsters University. I'll admit, it's not a movie I'm particularly ecstatic about, looking at the bigger picture. It's one of the more mediocre of Pixar films kicking off the sequel era of the company. But even though I wouldn't rate it even vaguely close to the quality and charm of the original Monsters, Inc., within this movie is a scene that when I watched for the first time in cinemas, I felt shone brighter than any other scene in the entire franchise. Sure, the Monsters at Work finale was nice, and Monsters, Inc. has all sorts of iconic scenes, now put that thing back where it came from, or so help me! But this scene, above all else to me, is my favourite moment from the entire Monsters trilogy du duology plus one. Hmm. For some context, we've been witnessing Mike and Sully mature in the realms of Monsters University, and most notably, Mike doing everything right to be as scary as possible, despite clearly visually not being. Culminating in the finale of a scare competition that they win, as Mike's machine was rigged. Distraught and determined to be a real scarer, Mike then commits the most heinous act in their entire reality entering the human world just outright. Of course, it doesn't seem so bad in the moment, but things go downhill fast. It starts off just how you'd expect. Mike has never been scary, and this next child probably will feel the same. If anything, you feel a little embarrassed for Mike, as the child only finds him amusing. But then... Oh, schmoopsie poo. This isn't your ordinary bedroom. What happens when a monster fails their mission? Or worse yet, how do you resolve jeopardizing your dimensional secret? We next jump to Sully who's bursting onto the scene, eventually diving through the door himself amidst the mess. And now the human world looks a little different. The flashing red and blue light single-handedly lighting the scene, the lack of anyone around indoors, the investigative adults just nearby, and now a giant bear-sized Sully sticking out like a sore thumb. This is like the worst case scenario. Talk about high stakes. Especially now the humans have spotted the spotted beast and are giving chase. And he's bright blue! Still, somehow Sully gets away. Crisis averted, at least for a time, but it's here where this moment really shines. Sully, in escaping, ends up finding Mike just sat by a lake. Not some bright and colorful cartoony monster lake, a realistic lake, draped in gray tones and ambient cicadas in the distance. Are they crickets? I, I don't actually know. It's a scene about reality in reality, or a close enough equivalent. It's here that Monsters University finally confronts its message, and it's a heartbreaking one. It's the idea that maybe you can't always follow your dreams. Maybe for some choices you make, personal failure is an inevitability, and you can only achieve what is realistically possible for yourself as Mike is just now realising. He sits dejected, feet almost touching the water, his green almost completely desaturated, as Sully observes, obscured in the shadows, yet still glowing in radiant blue. He will always be more successful. And as he calls out to Mike, there is no response, just the night ticking on with or without him, until eventually, You were right. They weren't scared of me. The single fact that tarnishes the last decade and a half of Mike's blood, sweat, and tears. For Mike, nothing else in the world matters more than the importance of this one fact. And it's emblematic even further of the theme of this movie, that some people are just built different. No, but really, in this monstrous society of all shapes and sizes, how you're shaped at birth can define how you will succeed. For a cyclops bull like Mike, he could spend years researching into the night, pass through any theory test with flying colours, and from an objective perspective, do absolutely everything right. 
He could be the most motivated person in the classroom, the most invested in the end goal, and the most avid fan of the art of scaring. He could be the one who wanted it more than anyone. And yet, just because of the way he was born, as a small, cute, green little gremlin ball, he could never truly reach his childhood dreams. He could never be the best version of the Mike Wazowski of his dreams. I'm just... not. Because in the reality of this world, there will always be people better than him through the action of just... existing. And Sullivan is the total embodiment of that. But before we go any further, if you haven't already, subscribe! Or hey, I'm thinking I might make these scene breakdowns a more regular thing, so tell me, what animated scenes really impacted you the most? I'd love some more video essay suggestions. Come check out all my other links plastered everywhere, hit that bell if you haven't already, and one more thing, London Comic Con is a thing next week. I want to break out of my shell a little bit more, so if you see somebody that looks like this, if you're attending, Come say hi Daz, and hopefully it's actually me. I would love to meet somebody from the outside world. It's just not something that comes naturally to me. Anyway, back to this scene. Built like a beast with a well-honored family name, Sully is the Chad of the classroom. Immediately respected by others, peers, and even teachers alike, and with little to no effort. The most successful student of the class. Of all people to be here tonight, James P. Sullivan is by far the worst candidate. Look, Mike, I know how you feel. Don't do that! Please don't do that! You do not know how I feel! Mike, calm down. And it's true! Throughout the events of this film, Sully has done next to nothing to earn the respect of the people around him. He's been idolized at almost every step for nothing more than being the son of the right monster with the right physique to boot. Monsters like you have everything. You don't have to be good. You can mess up over and over again and the whole world loves you. This is the cruel reality of the monster's society, and it's the same of our own. Some people have to fight tooth and nail for an ounce of respect, whilst others are granted it upon arrival, and that is a hard pill to swallow. And especially brave of Pixar to plant into their messaging. You'll never know what it's like to fail, because you were born a Sullivan! That's the harsh reality this film initially wants to confront. And then we get the response. Sully has heard Mike's grievances and steps out of the shadows, exposing himself to the light as he discusses his inner thoughts too. I'm the Sullivan who flunked every test, the one who got kicked out of the program, the one who was so afraid to let everyone down that I cheated. Being put on a pedestal comes with its own tribulations. Having high standards placed onto you means being forced to live up to those expectations. Being respected at the gate means having to sustain that respect as an ongoing chore. And having all eyes on you when you haven't warranted it, adds all the more pressure to live up to someone else's imagination of yourself. It's not an enviable position either. As they say, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Mike, I'll never know how you feel. But you're not the only failure here. How come you never told me that before? Because we weren't friends before. So what's the solution here? Where do we go from this point? Congrats on your friendship, now now go get an unappreciated retail job? Well first, those high stakes have returned, it's time to just get out of here. But this isn't just your padded out chase sequence, it is the response this movie has to its established conundrum. Since Mike was born as the small, ignorable jawbreaker, he's barely noticeable by the pursuing humans. It's Sully that has to take all the brunt of that drama. Being a blue bear has its downsides, and the stakes are naturally heightened on someone born like that. Not to mention, he's just not as agile as the bipedal pinball dude. So when we come to one of those Pokemon cliff edges, you, you know the ones, Sully is essentially trapped, whilst Mike is unburdened. So without another thought, the solution is easy. Easy. For in this world, whether both like it or not, Sully is the main character. And Mike? Well, perhaps his best position is in the supporting role, as the two do so without a second thought here. But it comes to more than that, as we'll see soon. The two escape back to that cabin in the woods, finally ready to return to the monster's world, only for... <gasps> no! Until the authorities arrive, this door stays off. Put that thing back where it came from, or so help me! 
The true solution hasn't been reached just yet, and only while cornered in a cabin in the woods can Mike truly reach his conclusion. See, through all of his depressing realization, there was one statement Mike made that was incorrect. I could show everybody that, that Mike Wazowski is something special, and I'm just not. Mike Wazowski might not have been born with the sharpest teeth, or the tallest stature, the greatest roar, or the angriest eyes, but what he didn't have at birth, he made up for every year since. And that was his theory. Being special doesn't come entirely from what you are given, but also from what you can deliver. And though Mike might not be suited to be a scarer, what Mike does have in droves is the ability to be a great manager one of the best. There is still a place for him within the scare energy industry, even if it's not exactly as he envisioned, he could still be a vitally intertwined part of it. And so this final act all comes down to one final task, to scare the humans, the real, adult, humans. The toughest judges this world can offer. Using a series of perfect theoretical techniques, scratches on the walls, slamming doors, paranormal illusions, paranoia triggers, and of course, the disarmament of their defenses. This final sequence is the embodiment of everything Mike can contribute to his craft and the culmination of the last decade of his work, all to be fit hand in hand with the natural talents of his new official friend to conclude us with one good scare that's been fully orchestrated by Mike alone. <laughs> The apotheosis of the whole concept of energy-based dimensional doors, achieved through a decade and a half of hard work by the guy without a scary bone in his body. Oh. How did you do this? This scene alone, I think, is what warranted the entire need for this sequel. Don't ask me. This, to me, was the greatest scene in the entire Monsters franchise. For its cinematography into a desaturated world of realism, the dialogue between two defeated characters, the pinnacle of what the Monsters universe can offer, and a message delivery that stands out against every other Pixar movie's messaging. Though to be fair, I swear every Pixar movie greenlights their movies based on the conclusion of the third act, and just makes their way backwards from there. The goodbye scene in Toy Story 3, the memory scene in Coco, the piano scene in Soul- <coughs> The piano scene in Soul- PIANO SCENE IN SOUL- Pia there we go. The piano scene in Soul, you get what I mean. And you ever notice how from this point on in the monster's chronology, Mike goes from being the protagonist of this film to the supporting character of everything later? But he never lets it get him down. Even though he takes so, so many L's later in his adult life, Mike continues forwards with the brightest optimism of the bunch eventually leading the world's energy industry through entirely different means, through both his birth given stature as well as his hard work and determination. Was this really just one scene or is it more like an extended sequence? Regardless, this has to be my favourite moment of the entire Monsters franchise, and though I recognise this movie has a bit of a mediocre and cliche plotline with a soundtrack that's a little too heavy on the brass for my tastes, <laughs> To me, this moment is the monster's world at its true peak. The finale to Monsters at Work was pretty nice too. For now though, I think I'd best leave things be. Gotta do something truly scary for adult humans, like work out my taxes or something. My name's been Daz, you didn't really care, come say hi at London Comic Con maybe? And I'll see you all in a bit.